Okay, everyone, thank you for joining us uh, today for the webinar on analyzing uh, inhibitor residence time. We'll be using some examples of uh, kinases uh, utilizing the ADP assay. Uh, first, I just wanted to give you a brief overview about Bellbrook Labs. So at Bellbrook, we actually have um, two assay platforms. We were founded in 2002 by Bob Lowry and John Major in Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, the two assay platforms uh, you might be familiar with the first is the transcreener, uh, high throughput screening assay, which we'll be talking about today. This is a biochemical assay um, for high throughput screening and profiling of enzymatic activity. Uh, we also have the IUVO microchondrid array. This is a phenotypic assay based around microplate architecture uh, for measuring things such as chemotaxis or tumor cell invasion. As I mentioned, today's focus is going to be on the transcreener assays. Uh, there are actually multiple uh, detection methods for this. Um, today, it's, uh, we will be focusing on the ADP assay for the case studies with some kinases, although this is also able to measure ATPase and helicase activity. Um, and as you can see, we have several other readouts as well. If you have any questions on these or on uh, assay development or optimization of the protocol, please feel free to contact us. Um, and then just to briefly introduce ourselves, uh, my name is Roland Carrillo. I'm the Director of Sales and Business Development. I've been with uh, Bellbrook Labs for about a year now, um, although I've been in the high throughput screening and assay development space for uh, several years. Uh, today's speaker will be Mira Kumar. She's our Senior Application Scientist, and she has over uh, 10 years industry experience with uh, assay development and high throughput screening. Um, our contact information is here in case you should uh, need to reach us. And uh, just to mention, we will be recording the webinar today and providing everyone with a slide set and a link to that recording, uh, just in case there's any information that you can't uh, take down. There are some parts that uh, delve a little bit into the math that you might want the uh, notes for later. Um, and with that, I'll go ahead and let uh, Mira get started. Thank you very much, uh, Roland, and thank you all for joining me today on this webinar titled Analyzing Kinase Residence Inhibitor Times Using Transcreener Technology. Uh, the agenda for today's talk, I will briefly go over the uh, transcreener technology, the platform itself, and move on to a method outlining how to determine the drug residence time using um, jump dilution method. Um, and primarily, the protocol that uh, we follow here is adapted from Robert Copeland's book on evaluation of enzyme inhibitors in drug discovery. Um, so transcreener technology. Uh, the platform relies on highly specific antibodies that are able to differentiate between nucleotides on the basis of a single phosphate or even a small methyl group. Selectivities of the product nucleotides, for example, ADP, um, versus the substrates, um, like ADP versus ATP, range anywhere from 150-fold to 1,000-fold. It depends upon the nucleotide that we are testing. For example, the AMP antibody has a 1,000-fold selectivity. The ADP antibody has about 150-fold selectivity. Now, differentiation between closely related nucleotides with subtle structural changes is central to the technology as uh, it allows the detection of the enzyme products, for example, let's say ADP, in the presence of excess of ATP. Now, this is a primary requirement for measuring enzyme, uh, enzyme's initial velocity. So having said that, um, all the transcreener assays, the four assays that Roland talked about, all of them generate a Z prime value greater than 0 0.7 at substrate conversion levels of less than 10 percent, um, uh, usually even far lower than 10 percent over the full range of initial substrate concentration. So we make initial velocity uh, uh, measurement really easy with this technology platform. Uh, direct detection of nucleotide is unique to our platform uh, because the method is based on just uh, interaction of two uh, detection reagents shown here. One is the monoclonal antibody against the uh, product of the enzyme reaction. For example, here this is a monoclonal antibody against ADP and a tracer molecule. Tracer is nothing but ADP that's conjugated to a fluorophore. Now, um, 
as ADP is formed from the enzyme reaction, it displaces the tracer and uh, binds to the antibody and uh, this causes a change in its fluorescence properties. Um, in the case of TRFRET and FI measurements, the antibody itself is uh, co covalently labeled. Um, uh, for the TRFRET, we use a terbium label and for FI, we use a quencher, uh, like our quencher. Um, but for FP, it's unmodified, the antibody is in its native conformation. So transgreener assays, as you can see, has very fewer um, have very fewer reagents. The only two that detection reagents are the antibody and the tracer. And uh, for a minute, shift your attention to the graphic that shows coupled assay methods. As you can see, it's a very convoluted approach where you have to convert the nucleotide or the product formed from an enzyme reaction using different coupling enzymes and a reporter enzyme to um, uh, to detect the signal, to generate a signal. Now each coupling or each reporter enzyme that's used is a potential target for compounds being screened which increases the risk of false positives or even missing a hit and um, it adds to the labor of going back and deconvoluting your hits. Uh, so uh, it's a much convoluted approach um, as opposed to our direct um, assay format that's uh, very simple to use. And on top of it I would like to mention that of um, the three formats, all the three formats, we use a far red tracer uh, to minimize the compound interference. So shown here, um, any ideal assay, I mean, uh, the technology is good, but the assay is only good if it has good, excellent reagent and signal stability. So shown here are two graphs. One is the um, uh, reagent stability. And in reagent stability, what we did was we prepared the ADP detection mixtures. Uh, so just the tracer and the antibody themselves were prepared and stored for 21 days at the designated temperatures. Um, prior to adding freshly prepared 10 micromolar ATP ADP standards. Now the day zero uh, was prepared with fresh detection mixture and as you can see they're right on top of each other uh, for 21 days the detection mixtures are very stable even at 37 degrees the reagents are really stable. Um, now uh, the signal stability is when you prepare a standard curve and add the detection mixture and the plate is uh, red at uh, zero hour, one hour, four hours and so on and as you can see see the signal is very stable. The error bars that you um, see here are standard deviations of the mean of 24 uh, replicates. Now, uh, the direct detection means that the protocol is the simplest one that's available to run your enzyme reaction as shown here. Um, uh, you run your enzyme reaction, that's step one. Um, and then you add your detection mix, um, the transgreener reagents with the stop mix and read the plates. Now you could uh, run this assay either as a continuous mode or an endpoint mode. Now for an endpoint mode, you just add your tracer and your um, antibody in the stop uh, buffer that we provide. The stop buffer just has EDTA that would chelate magnesium and if you have an, any other stop reagent you can actually mix your tracer and antibody in that stop buffer and add it after um, X amount of time to run it as an endpoint assay. Um, but uh, for today's purpose, the ability of transgreener assay to be run in kinetic mode is what makes uh, detection of residence time possible. So you can use it in continuous mode by just eliminating the stop and detect buffer. So you run your enzyme reaction and at time zero, add your detection mixture, tracer and antibody and read the plate. Um, and this makes optimization of enzyme reactions as a development simpler, reduces reagent consumption. And uh, I like the fact that but by just running one assay, I get tons of data out to, uh, to analyze. So um, it's very simple to use and it allows the detection mixture to be pre-mixed and stored for long periods of time. Um, you know, through the eight hour day, you can keep it at room temperature or at four degrees. And uh, unlike the transient signals that you get from coupled um, enzyme assays, the transcreener signals persist for a long period of time, at least overnight. And in some cases with um, in some of our assays, you know, it's even uh, the signal is stable for uh, more than 24 hours for days. So plates can be read long after you have added your detection reagents. Now these properties make transcreener um, assay very easy to use in an automated HDS environment. So the graph below shows an example of the raw data that you get from a transcreener assay. And um, um, any um, competitive binding assay, this is not anything specific to the transcreener assay, any competitive binding assay is by nature not 
nonlinear. This is the kind of response that you would get if you plot uh, uh, your raw data. Now, if you want to check the linearity, you will have to run a standard curve and convert the polarization data into the product form that's shown here uh, to verify if you're following michaelis menten parameters or for uh, determining enzymological parameters like KMV max and such. Um, Having said that, running a standard curve is not mandatory. It's completely optional. You could just use your raw data to uh, to determine EC50 concentrations, EC80, IC50, and whatnot. Um, standard curve is required if you want to determine enzymological parameters. So it's an optional um, uh, experimental detail that you could do in order to convert your data from this format into the linear format. Uh, and this graph here shows the universal nature of the assay. Universal detection means you can use this assay with any kinase. Basically, the ADP assay could be used with its, the, the breadth of it is you could use with kinases, ATPases, any enzyme class that produces ADP. Now, within the kinase, you could use it for um, uh, lipid kinase or carbohydrate kinase in addition to protein kinases. And you can also use this assay with either peptide substrate or full-length protein substrate so it's universal in the um, uh, definition that you could use it with any kinase or any acceptor substrate and it provides a, a physiologically uh, relevant measure of the kinase activity. Uh, the assay can be tuned for robust initial velocity concentration at any ATP concentration. Now, I briefly mentioned about this in one of the previous slides, but uh, transcreener assay requires detection of ADP in the presence of excess ATP. So we assume the initial velocity enzyme reaction conditions. Um, now, we, uh, the way we detect the antibody, select the antibody concentration is traditionally by running uh, antibody titration. So in x-axis, you see that the antibody is varied here. And you do it uh, typically in the buffer of your enzyme reaction with any of the initial ATP concentrations shown here. And you pick the most optimal concentration of the antibody is called the EC85 concentration. It's the region where the curve starts sloping down. Now this uh, EC85 shows that 85% of the antibody is bound to the tracer. Now this is a great compromise for a wonderful assay window and a very good sensitivity. Now you can fine tune it by going, uh, you know, let's see, if you want to make this assay more sensitive, uh, you can add less antibody, but you will take, uh, uh, the assay window would not be as great. So it's a, uh, EC85 is the best compromise for a good assay window and sensitivity, but it gives you the uh, flexibility to fine-tune the assay as per your uh, requirements. Now, uh, this was seen as uh, a as a task that people had to do to determine what's the best antibody concentration to determine. So to aid as a starting point, I would say, we uh, found that there is a, a linear correlation between this EC85 concentration and the ATP concentration, and that's what is plotted here. And there is a linear equation, so you can just plug in your ATP concentration and determine the optimal uh, antibody concentration. I would like to repeat that that's a great starting point, but having said that, you know, if you want to really truly optimize it. It's always uh, advisable to run a uh, titration such as this shown here in the buffer of your choice. Now if you, once you find your uh, antibody concentration, you can run standard curves like this anywhere from 0.1 to 1000 micromolar ATP ADP. So it's very flexible and um, the amount depends upon the initial ATP concentration that you're going to use in your enzyme reaction. Um, this slide here um, depicts the standard curves from three different formats, FP, FI, and TR, FRET assay, and it shows a range of ATP concentration starting from 0.1 micromolar all the way up to 1 millimolar ATP. Um, so as you can see, this all three formats allows um, uh, uh, allows the measurement at different ATP concentrations, although I, sh I would say that uh, FP is more suited for such purposes than FI or TR-FRET. Now the table below gives a uh, 
uh, z prime value and z prime is a statistical uh, um, value that shows how robust an assay is uh, so um, you can see at one micromolar ATP ADP standard curve 10 percent conversion meaning 0.1 micromolar ADP detection we get a really good z prime value here for all three formats um, so all the three formats the sensitivity of the assays are quite similar across the three formats but I would just say the FP assay probably uh, have a slight edge over the other two. Um, so, um, so with that, uh, I'm going to, I just wanted to give a very brief introduction and not spend much time on the transcreener technology. And with that, I would like to move on to residence time, which is the topic of today's webinar. Um, what is uh, drug residence time? Um, so, uh, the definition of drug residence time is given as the lifetime of um, the time that um, a tar uh, a drug molecule spends um, occupying the target. Now, um, a drug molecule, let's call it ligand here, uh, must engage and occupy um, a physiologically relevant target molecule. Um, let me call that a receptor. It could be an enzyme and the drug could be the inhibitor. So it could be receptor ligand or receptor um, enzyme inhibitor. So it has to occupy the target. That's the rule. And the effectiveness of this target uh, just the, uh, the affinity is measured by IC50 that we routinely run in the lab uh, and um, is reported as potency and for a long time that was one of the IC50 and KIs where the only values reported as far as the affinity or the potency of the drug molecule goes. Um, now these values are dependent upon the kinetics of association of the ligand to the receptor molecule and also the dissociation of the ligand from its receptor. Um, but the duration of time, the uh, duration of time that or the time period where the ligand occupies the target, that is defined as the residence time. So say if your ligand occupies and resides on the receptor for a long period of time, um, it's better able to engage the target and therefore would show better pharmacological properties even after the ligand is eliminated from the circulation. So medicinal chemists um, uh, are very interested in finding the residence time during HIT validation itself so they can measure uh, the lifetime, the occupancy of the time period that the uh, ligand occupies the target. Now the residence time therefore is affected by both association rate, uh, the inhibitors binding say to the uh, enzyme and the dissociation rate of the EI complex. Um, and that's more in the case of in vitro uh, because uh, there are, it's the diffusion that uh, helps in the EI complex formation, right? So uh, in, in vivo the residence time is primarily dependent only on the dissociation rates. So based on that, uh, we could quantitate, we could uh, determine the residence time by taking the reciprocal uh, of the drug target complex dissociation. So 1 over the K off rate would quantitatively give you the measurement of the residence time. So moving on, um, there has been a great um, importance now being, there is a great importance now being given to not just knowing the affinity uh, or the potency of the compound which is determined by IC50 or KI values, but also a function of the drug occupancy on the target itself which is a measurement of the residence time uh, and hence uh, uh, today's webinar. So there are two views of uh, how the uh, enzyme interacts with the uh, inhibitor or the receptor in interacts with the ligand. And this is one of the view that we, views that we have uh, read in most of the textbooks, commonly known as the lock and key mechanism or the static view of drug target interaction. Uh, this image um, uh, I borrowed from Robert Copeland's uh, textbook. And uh, in this uh, model, uh, the target macromolecule contains a binding pocket here, shown here. Um, and uh, we, uh, the binding pocket is complementary to the drug molecule or the ligand both sterically and um, electronically, so there is a favorable interaction between the receptor and the ligand or the enzyme and the inhibitor and it forms this um, complex. Now this complex assumes, the, um, this model assumes that the recognition elements of the binding pocket are held static in the most complementary arrangement with respect to the drug uh, uh, receptor ligand interactions. Um, so this can be quantified by uh, mathematically related parameters like IC50 or KD and such. Um, but in um, 
there are some enzymes that depict this static uh, behavior of the lock and key mechanism, but most um, scenarios do require some conformational modulation for the um, uh, enzyme inhibitor complex to form. And um, shown is a conformational uh, adaption um, model. This is the uh, this is also uh, borrowed, this figure is also borrowed from the textbook. Um, so in the conformational model uh, going um, counterclockwise direction, um, you start with a receptor. We are assuming that the target, uh, the receptor or the enzyme exists in several different conformations. And for simplicity here in the textbook, uh, he has assumed that there are two different conformations shown by R and uh, R star. Now, when there is no ligand, the equilibrium favors this conformation, the R conformation. But upon the addition of ligand, the conformation uh, is selected to favor R star, and ligand binds to the receptor, forms this R star L complex. That is the conformational model. Okay. Um, now, um, in uh, in the in the induced fit model going uh, in this direction, um, it starts, the, the goal is to reach the same um, R star L state. The final form is this, but it, as it arrives there in a different path. The path that it follows is once ligand um, comes to, uh, it, once you add the ligand to the receptor or you add the inhibitor to your enzyme, now they form a RL complex like up after the, that complex is formed, it undergoes a conformational change. The ligand induces a change in the RL conformation to R star L. So it's just a different path that it follows to reach the same uh, final um, complex. So um, most of the, the enzyme examples, the case studies that I'm going to show you today, they all follow this conformational uh, model or the induced fit model and uh, cannot be explained by the one step um, uh, the static model. So uh, what are the tools available to measure drug residence time? The most commonly used methods are binding kinetics, um, uh, and they are surface plasma resonance that probably most of you use. And this requires that um, the first uh, thing is that you have to immobilize proteins on a uh, sensor surface. Um, now that could cause, create some problems. Um, the second thing is uh, you require expensive and specialized instruments and accessories to record these measurements. And um, all these assays are low pro throughput and provides binding kinetics information. Um, BioCore, for example, um, provides several models of SPR-based instruments. Now each of these instruments costs you anywhere from 100,000 to 300,000. Uh, 300k, and uh, you can only use, it's only compatible with BioCore accessories which cost, like these electrodes themselves cost um, $100 each. So it's a very expensive um, assay, expensive um, um, protocol to follow, and it's not high throughput. So uh, it kind of restricts um, many people from measuring residence time because because of the expense associated with it. Uh, there are other methods, change in intrinsic fluorescence or non-equilibrium reaction kinetics, but they, they are again binding um, uh, protocols. But uh, so there remains a need for a more high throughput and universal way of measuring uh, residence time or measuring the dissociation rate, I should say. And so uh, LifeTech does have a fluorescence uh, binding assay. They use Lantha screen binding assay. Uh, it is high throughput, no doubt, but it's not an uh, activity-based assay. So uh, today we are going to propose how you could measure residence time using transcreener assay. And it's not just a binding assay. It also, uh, it's an activity assay. And it does not require any uh, um, uh, expensive accessories or um, any complicated instrument. You can just use your multi-mode reader and transcreener re reagents to run the protocol. Now here is a streamlined protocol for uh, determining dr uh, drug residence time. Step A, you have to determine the ECAT of your target concentration of your enzyme. 
you're going to do that anyway for running a dose response curve. So that's step A to determine the ECAT of your uh, enzyme concentration. Step B, you have to determine the IC50 values of your dose response compounds, which you will be running uh, as part of your HIT validation. Um, the third step is when you take that IC50 values and uh, multiply it by a factor 10. And I would go into that, why we pick that factor 10. and um, incubate that with um, excess of enzyme concentration, 100 times 100 fold of the ECAT, the optimal concentration. And you incubate it for a period of time. I typically do it for 30 minutes, but there are um, publications that suggest that people have even done it for 60 minutes. So uh, you pre-incubate for a set period of time and then do uh, what is referred to as jump dilution or infinite dilution. Um, so you dilute it 100 fold into an enzyme reaction uh, that contains transcranial detection reagents and all the enzyme reaction substrates and ATP and whatnot and then start um, continuously reading it over time to monitor the change in fluorescence which reflects the activity of enzyme that um, you know that you gain back after it starts dissociating. So you do a data analysis and we, I'll show you how do we do the data analysis and calculate residence time. So um, this is a graphical representation of uh, jump dilution methods. So uh, in a tube, you incubate your enzyme and inhibitor, um, uh, incubate for 30 minutes, allowing the EI complex to form, um, most often by the induced um, uh, model or the conformational model. And then jump dilute it 100 fold into a 384 well plate that contains um, 19.8 microliters, so 0.2 of this, and 19.8 microliter of what I call reaction mix. Now the reaction mix has excess of ATP, um, acceptor substrates, and the transcranial detection reagents. And you just charge, you mix the plate and uh, put it into a plate reader, and it reads every five minutes and monitors the uh, fluorescence change over time. So. Um, this uh, graph here, once again, I have uh, I have been borrowing a lot of images from either Robert Copeland's textbook or this is from one of his publications uh, that talks about uh, jump dilution method or infinite dilution. So this is a method that determines the reversibility of enzyme inhibitors during uh, HIT validation. So let's look at um, when you run a dose response curve like this, you determine the IC50 value. So for pre-incubation, I said we select a tenfold higher uh, enzyme concentration so somewhere here. Now that uh, represents that 90.9% uh, that uh, of enzyme is now bound to the inhibitor. So the EI complex is formed. Your, um, you kind of um, ensuring, uh, making sure that this, uh, the, there's a complete binding of the enzyme to the inhibitor. So quantitatively, that should be 90.9%. Now, once you jump dilute from here 100 fold, from this point onto 100 fold, you reach this um, uh, IC10 concentration here, which represents that nine, um, around 9% 9 of the enzyme is now theoretically bound to the target. So you do a 100-fold uh, jump dilution. And um, I had said, you know, you, you uh, pick 100-fold uh, of your enzyme. The enzyme concentration is decided based on when you do a 100-fold uh, dilution, you want to make sure that the enzyme still uh, would show a signal that you can measure over time. So you pick an enzyme concentration. Typically, when I pick ECAT concentration and go 100-fold, it works well for me. Um, so that's how you pay, determine the concentrations. And shown here is one of uh, the graphs that uh, was shown in this paper. And this is simulated data. This is not from experimental data. But it goes on to say, uh, if you have the product formed in your y-axis, the, the line that you see here represents um, no inhibitor control or just the product formed from enzyme alone. Enzyme alone, no inhibitor. And here is a slowly dissociating inhibitor. So for slowly dissociating inhibitor, when you monitor the product formed over time, you would, um, one would expect to see um, a curvilinear uh, graph as shown in this example from the textbook. So um, now consider a situation where uh, the, the residence time is really, really long for an inhibitor. And I will show you some examples like that today. Um, in which case, like you are measuring it over time and uh, the graph kind of looks like this. Over here, it almost looks linear. You won't be able to see the curvilinear 
a graph because the residence time is really longer uh, than the total time window that's observed to measure the residence time. So these are the points that I want you to keep in mind as we move into the case studies. Uh, so for slowly dissociating enzymes, you would like to see this kind of a curve pattern that we call curvilinear. Now, uh, so as I mentioned, the following steps are to be followed. First is to determine the enzyme concentration. And as a case study, I'm picking ABL1 here and shows um, uh, the, the uh, polarization change from, a, I call this the red trace as the complete reaction where it has um, the enzyme. Uh, uh, which is titrated has both the peptide substrate, ABL tide and ATP, that's called as a complete reaction. The blue trace here is in the absence of um, the peptide substrate, just ATP alone. And you do see some non-productive ATP hydrolysis. And I have seen it with some methyl transferases and I see it more, uh, it's more prevalent in kinases. And because water goes into the uh, pocket uh, and uh, uses that as a substrate. But the concentration that I am picking here, 2.8 nanomolar of enzyme, um, as you can see when I convert it into a product formed, um, I see very little contribution from non-productive hydrolysis. So it's a good compromise of the enzyme that I'm going to pick for my dose response curves and for my residence time experiments. So you run your um, um, enzyme reaction, pick the optimal enzyme concentration. I typically go with EC80 concentration, although you can eyeball it and determine what's the best concentration that you would like to go for. Just make sure that you're following initial velocity at that point. Now, the second step is to determine the IC50 of your, uh, uh, or run the dose response curves of your inhibitors and uh, determine the IC50 compounds. Now, I picked four inhibitors here and um, I uh, purposefully selected such inhibitors that would show a range of residence time so you can appreciate that um, uh, the, you know, you can study um, uh, drugs that have, that show almost reversible, uh, reversibility kind of pattern and some that uh, show really long drug residence time. So anyway, so you run a dose response curve and I picked the EC80 concentration 2.8 nanomolar of ABL1, titrated the enzyme and um, determined the IC50 as shown here. That's the second step. Now, pre-intubation step, so you, the first step is your, as I said, I go 100 times more than the EC80 concentration, so 2.8 nanomolar times 100, 280 nanomolar, and then for the inhibitors, I go 10 times the IC50, like we just uh, discussed in the graph from uh, Copeland's textbook, so 10 times IC50 value, and that's what is shown here. So I mix them two together for, um, um, uh, at least uh, 30 minutes. So I, I do it 100 fold, but at least it should be 50 fold so that when you dilute it, you know, you see some uh, enzyme activity and uh, the gain of signal. Otherwise, it would be very difficult to do that. Um, now, if enzyme is uh, um, uh, if enzyme is very precious and you don't have enough enzyme, there are other methods that are suggested, uh, like separation method, where you can take enzyme and inhibitor and put them in a uh, you know like a G8 column together, and then um, after 30 minutes, spin them down, and then uh, you know hopefully uh, based on the pore size, you can select that you know the inhibitors, the free inhibitor would pass through, and you will get. Uh, enrich it for enzyme and inhibitor complex. Um, I have not tried personally those methods, but that's another uh, um, uh, method that you could uh, try to do uh, to enrich EI complex. I just go by this pre-incubation method and it has worked really well for me, although there are other methods that you could follow as well. So um, jump dilution, so you have your, you pre-incubated, now you have enriched it or ensured that complete EI complex is formed. And then I do a hundred-fold dilution. Now it's called jump dilution, as I mentioned, when we do a jump dilution, you're diluting it um, into a hundred-fold into a high concentration of substrates like ATP um, and your acceptor substrate and then also the transferrin detection reagents are in there. But with the high concentration of substrate condition, we are causing it to um, essentially jump in the equilibrium condition, and that's why it gets its name, jump dilution. Um, 
Now, after this 100-fold dilution, now your inhibitor concentration, so remember we, we had 10 times IC50 and we are doing 100-fold dilution, so now you are one-tenth of the enzyme concentration. That, along with the fact that now, um, you know, there's a jump in equilibrium with um, high substrate, acceptor substrate and ATP in there, um, this combination, this jump in equilibrium prevents rebinding after dissociation. So once EI complex is formed and as the uh, inhibitor is dissociating slowly, uh, we, are, uh, we, are, um, uh, we are ensuring by this jump dilution method that the rebinding uh, will not happen. And that's, therefore we can follow uh, continuously or you can even do it as an endpoint method, but you can monitor the change in fluorescence over time, the recovery of the enzyme activity over time, and the rate of that is what we determine as the K-off rate because we did a jump dilution. Um, so uh, once again, uh, the once the sorry. Um, so 0.2 microliter of this EI complex is diluted into 19.8 microliter of the detection mixture in a low volume 384 well plate. And now this detection mixture has high ATP and substrate concentration and we also add the tracer and the uh, antibody to it. Now the plate was mixed and immediately uh, read for every five minutes for four hours in a TCAN uh, plate reader under FP mode. And you can do it for FI also. Using our assay, I've just shown FP in uh, in all these examples. So once you get the raw data out, this is how your graphs would look like. I have not done any data manipulation here. I just plotted uh, the polarization data over time. And um, just to uh, you know, reiterate with our assay, as ADP is produced, as the enzyme reaction progresses, the uh, polarization decreases. So the red trace here shows enzyme alone. So as you see with time, the polarization keeps going down, so more ADP is being produced. And the, the blue trace here is imatinib, and um, so enzyme plus imatinib, the uh, the purple trace is enzyme plus nilotinib and these two traces are either enzyme plus desatinib or enzyme plus ponatinib, the inhibitors of ABL. Now, what do you do with that raw data? So there are many ways uh, of data analysis, and this is where the residence time uh, gets very tricky. The experimental part is fairly easy, I would say. It's the data analysis that is very complicated. So in this particular example, what I did was I took the raw data, and I tried to uh, analyze it using one-phase decay, just using raw data. So I normalize the data based on my controls. So uh, I call the inhibitor without enzyme as 0% um, completion or 0% activity. Um, the enzyme reaction has not gone to completion at all and that would be inhibitor without enzyme. And enzyme after completion when it reaches this plateau, I'm calling that as, um, you know, completed reaction or 100%, okay. So I'd normalize my raw data based on those controls that I run. Um, and uh, you always want to run uh, just, you know, uh, do jump dilution with just enzyme alone with DMSO as your, um, instead of the inhibitor, just to make sure that the enzyme still retains its activity after 30 minutes or 60 minutes and that would serve as a great control. Now, um, as you can see, uh, the graph cat prism, you know, spits out all these values, the rates and half-life and tau for you, uh, but it's not a very accurate way of doing it. But uh, it does give very uh, relevant information. I mean, looking at this graph, I can definitely say that imatinib has the shortest residence time. It comes off ABL1 really quickly, and uh, I can conclude that desatinib and ponatinib takes really long. So it does give me really relevant information, important information, and for people who are just looking to rank order their uh, hits based on this, this is an easy method of doing it. You don't have to go through uh, any other data manipulation. And the little graph you see is just uh, uh, blown up, uh, you know, I just zoomed up in this portion. So you can appreciate how quickly the enzyme reaction is proceeding. So that is a data analysis using uh, raw data, um, but the reason I say it's not very accurate is because of two reasons. A is because, as I mentioned, all competitive binding assays are by nature nonlinear, and hence 
you know, uh, using this um, is not very accurate. You have to convert it into product form. That's a more accurate way of representing data. And number two is because one phase decay it does not use the rate integration equation. Um, um, or integrated rate equation, it uses another equation which is very similar but is not um, the same equation that we would like to use um, for measuring k off. So there are two reasons why this is not going to be very accurate, but it gives a, um, a fine idea about rank ordering your inhibitors with reference to uh, the occupancy. So. Um, so what we do is we take the MP values and convert it into product form. And I briefly mentioned how we do that in uh, one of the earlier uh, slides when I was outlining transcreener technology. So what I did in this particular case was I ran a standard curve side by side when I was doing my residence time experiments. So I could go back and convert each of that polarization value based on the standard curve into the amount of ADP produced here product formed. So this is no inhibitor enzyme alone, which was just incubated with DMSO, and this is enzyme with imatinib and enzyme with nilotinib and um, um, desatinib and punatinib. And I would like to um, uh, remind you now of the graph that I had, um, you know, of the simulated graph that I had shown from the textbook or from uh, Copeland's publication uh, that showed a curvilinear um, product formed for. Um, um, for slowly dissociating enzymes. So if you can, I mean, it's still, we have still not analyzed the data, but you can kind of um, look at the curvilinear approach that it's taking shape. So now how do you determine residence time? You've converted it into product form. Now what do you do? So go into graph pad prism and you would enter your uh, x values, which would be your time, and y values would be the product form. So you enter that data in there. Uh, now you have to use the, this is the perfect equation to use. Um, this is uh, referred to as the integrated rate equation. Um, and um, uh, where the k here, the k represents the rate of transition from slowly or inhibited velocity to uninhibited velocity. So if I go back to this graph and look at the, just focus on the green trace for a minute. So you see that it, it is very slow initially because it's still bound and then slowly as it comes out the rate changes. So at this point, uh, that's the K we are looking for, the, um, the uh, rate of transition from inhibited velocity to uninhibited velocity. So that's the rate we have to calculate. Now, um, how do I, so here is the equation uh, product formed, which is ADP in this case, is Vs times T. Um, uh, plus V0 minus Vs and multiplied by 1 minus exponent of minus kT times k uh, divided by k. Um, now where um, Vs represents the uninhibited enzyme velocity over here and V0 uh, represents the completely inhibited velocity. Now if you run uh, a standard curve and you you have already d done this experiment where as part of residence time. You could get the initial, if you plot it as the initial time point, as I'm showing here, the slope of this line, the black um, trace that you see here, the linear line that I see is show here, that is Vs. That's the slope of this line. And uh, sorry, that's the slope here. And um, the inhibited one is the slope here. Now when I plot this value onto this equation and I plug these numbers here, this is what I get. Okay, so what do I do with that? So I just plugged in, uh, you know, these numbers here. It should be reversed. I'm sorry. This should be v, uh, Vs and V0. So I just plug, uh, plug in these numbers, the velocities that I got from the linear graphs into the rate equation here. And then what do I do? So graph pad prism, unfortunately, does not have any uh, um, a program that you can automatically use to do the residence time calculation. You have to mathematically do this yourself um, to get the most accurate measurement. Otherwise, you could use one phase decay, which is close but not correct, the right way of doing it. 
So uh, you go into GraphPad Prism and when you click on the Analysis tab uh, on top, it would open up a new window. And under Equation tab that I show here, you can just enter the equation that I just showed. Um, and that's the new equation that you would enter. And you can call it residence time measurements or call it by any name because once it would save it and you can use that for, um, you know, for the future um, uh, experimental data analysis. And then you have to define the rules. So so under parameters, under rules for initial values, you know, under this tab here, go under K and I defined um, K as uh, 1 over the value of X at Y max. Now this is very arbitrary. Uh, you could just do it uh, over, uh, we, I tried a uh, couple different approaches and this seemed to be the one that works uh, for, you know, for uh, tight binders, for very long residence times and slow uh, dissociate. Um, slowly dissociating inhibitors and um, so on, but this is an arbitrary initial value that you have to provide and this is what I chose to provide. Now once you uh, provide that value, then GraphPad calculates uh, the rates for you. Now again, so this is, this is how the graphs would uh, need to look when you convert, when you plot this integrated, uh, use the integrated rate equation. So as you can see, this is the uh, no inhibitor control and imatinib that um, it seems almost reversible, you know, it, it follows uh, very similar to the no inhibitor control and then nilotinib and the other two, the long um, residence time. So based on that, if I calculate my residence time, these are the values I get. And I tried finding literature values and this, the literature values that I'm showing here, uh, these are from the Lantha screen poster that I found and they use one phase decay there. And um, uh, as you can see, I can definitely rank order like imatinib is comes off uh, is very fast dissociating the, uh, and uh, ponatinib and desatinib take the longest although the values do not agree um, uh, hundred percent but the rank ordering seems very close and I think the difference is because I used a totally different equation here uh, that I f uh, find is more accurate way of uh, representing the data. Uh, now, if I did, uh, uh, if I took the product formed and did one phase decay, you would see that my values now agree very closely to the, light, the to the Lantha screen binding as a residence time because it uses one phase decay. As you can see, um, uh, the rank ordering still remains the same, so I could still conclude that desatinib and ponatinib requires a longer period of time compared to imatinib or nilotinib. But as you can see, I don't see the curvilinear approach as was, um, you know, even though the data points shows that curvilinear nature, the program is plotting it using a totally different function and hence there is a discrepancy there. So I'm moving to uh, another case study just to reassure you that this method of calculation does work. Uh, so again, shown is an example of EGFR uh, kinase and um, shows a complete reaction here and this is um, um, just the peptide uh, uh, or in the presence of ATP alone um, without the peptide. And as you can see with just ATP, we do see non-productive hydrolysis, but the concentration that you choose around one nanomolar, um, you see very little um, non-productive ATP hydrolysis in the absence of the substrate. Now, uh, you, the next step, so you determine your enzyme concentration. That was step one, so we did that. And step two, you find, run your dose response curves. And I got really decent uh, curves for both erlotinib and lapatinib, but for um, uh, for this inhibitor, jafetinib, I, I, I'm assuming it's more potent, uh, or I wasn't sure if I'm hitting an assay wall, but I was getting really low IC50 values, so I'm just portraying it as less than one nanomolar. Um, so again, pre-incubation, uh, once more 100 times the concentration of your enzyme, so 150 nanomolar here, and then 10 times the IC50 concentrations shown here. And at this point, I'm not very substoichiometric. If you look at both these concentrations, they are 
very similar. Um, you should take care if they are really uh, less than you know one or ten fold or um, fifty fold difference. Then they are sub stoichiometric. That's not a good way of setting um, the jump uh, the pre incubation. And you might want to vary the conditions when you reach such a situation. But um, I have not I, I have not um, experienced that uh, in my uh, examples here. So uh, this is just again using the raw data. Um, so I'm just showing that you could still rank order your inhibitors. You could just take the raw data. You don't need to run a standard curve to convert them into ADP formed, into product formed. You can just use one phase decay of the raw data after you normalize it to percent completion and you get um, um, uh, good measurement of residence time, although not very accurate. Um, um, so the right way would be, therefore, to find the VS and VI based on your data and plug that into GraphPad Prism. You will have to do that for each of your enzymes. So I had to do it for ABL. I had to do it for each EFR or for Aurora. Each time you have to plug in a new equation so it follows the and then it kind of transforms it. It takes that data and generates um, and then um, uh, fits it to a curve using nonlinear regression and using the equation that you provide. And this is more accurate way of doing it. Um, so uh, once again, literature values from Lantha screen assay are shown here, but that was done using a one phase decay. Um, so when I did one phase decay, again, I see very similar values, although lapatinib did show a long, uh, very long residence time in, in my hand compared to erlotinib, gefitinib. Um, so, um, and this is the last example I would like to so, show. Aurora C, again, you know, determine the enzyme concentration and then dose response curve for this GSK compound. And um, when you plug in the equation, uh, you can, um, uh, you know, this is by doing your own equation and this is just using one phase decay after product formed. It gives very similar values, but uh, it's just that the curve fitting looks different um, and corresponds very well to the literature value that's published. Uh, the one thing that I would like to say is when you have a uh, limited supply of enzyme and um, for Aurora C I needed a lot of enzyme and probably one of the reason because um, typically Aurora uh, enzymes uh, work better when they are in complex with uh, centromere protein like INSENP but uh, I uh, uh, the enzyme that I had commercial source of enzyme that I got was just Aurora C so its activity um, even though it was uh, it had good activity but um, I had to use a lot of enzyme to get there. Um, probably if it was like um, um, in, in a complex, it would have been much better. Like they show in this paper um, that was published that they use Aurora C in complex with um, proteins that stabilizes it. Um, so if you uh, are in a situation like that and I had to use 100 times this concentration, that was a lot of enzyme. And I think um, in such situation, the separation method that I talked to briefly mention uh, would be very useful where you put the enzyme and the inhibitor together and then enrich it only for enzyme and inhibitor complex and you don't have to use 100 times the enzyme concentration because you would spin it down and remove all the free inhibitors and you would enrich it for the EI complex. Um, but I do have to mention that I have not validated that method myself. I've just read about it in, uh, in literature and in textbooks, but I have not personally tested out that method. Um, so with that, I would uh, like to um, summarize today's uh, talk that transcreener assay relies on highly selective antibodies um, for ADP with three different readouts, FPTR, FRET, and FI readouts. Direct uh, detection has advantages over the coupled assays in terms of simplicity of use and um, in terms of resistance to compound interference. Uh, the compounds can be fine-tuned for detection of kinases or ATPases, any uh, enzyme class that produces ADP anywhere from 0.1 to 1 millimolar, making it well suited for uh, profiling inhibitors uh, that have diverse ATP requirements. Um, and also the ability of our other assay to be run in kinetic mode enables determination of uh, residence time using a jump dilution method. Um, and uh, the residence time determined by um, uh, determined for ABL1, EGFR, and Aurora C inhibitors that I showed today uh, were consistent with literature values. 
And so with that, uh, I would like to conclude my talk. But before that, I would like to, uh, you know, this slide shows the references that I use. The first one is uh, a derivation of the uh, integrated rate equation that I showed. Uh, and uh, the other, um, the papers are mentioned here. And um, uh, the textbook was really very helpful. Um, the, t uh, the textbook is kind of like a Bible here at Bellbrook Labs. We follow um, the protocol that's listed there really, um, you know, with not just for a residence time for, you know, any drug discovery we do. Uh, use that as a guide. And I would like to thank uh, Robert Copeland um, because he did uh, look at my data and gave me some uh, good suggestions with respect to data analysis. And Tim Weigel for all his insights into uh, data analysis. And uh, definitely the Bellbrook Labster, um, we uh, uh, we had a very fruitful discussion about how to uh, use graph pad prism because it's not very user friendly when you have to do it the first time. So we all work together as a great team to get this done. So I would like to thank and acknowledge uh, everyone here. And with that, I will hand uh, it over to Roland uh, for concluding remarks. Thanks. Thank you very much, Mira, for the uh, presentation. Uh, we did have a couple of questions uh, already typed in, if you could uh, take a second to look at those. And as well as if anybody else has uh, any questions, uh, uh, now would be a good time uh, to ask, or you can follow up uh, with us directly as well. Um. OK, I, I'm, uh, I'm trying to read them, but it's kind of getting a little difficult. Let me see. Uh, can can you read out the question if sure. you can? Please, uh, the first one is uh, for the transfer for the jump dilution, uh, the yeah. 200 nanoliters. How did you uh, do the transfer on it, or what, what did you use for that? Uh, I actually uh, tr uh, I I have a, a pipette that does one microliter, so I could do 0.2, but I had to do it manually. We are not. Uh, um, we don't have automation facilities here, so we could I couldn't do, um, you know, use any automation. So I had to manually use a one microliter pipetter. Okay, um, and then we also had another open question about uh, the robustness of the assay. Uh, mm -hmm. So this was referring to uh, that we give the range that you can use, uh, uh, do point one percent conversion down to uh, one micromolar. ADP mm -hmm. product in a thousand uh, micromolar ATP, mm -hmm. um, uh, and, and so just questions around low activity kinases um, and the issue with having a high ATP shifting uh, the curve for uh, uh, tight binding or uh, uh, irreversible uh, inhibitors. Uh, let me, I'm trying to read the question. So the robustness of the assay, so typically um, uh, if, I, if I do not understand this question correctly and if my answer is not satisfactory, please email me so I can better, I, I do not have, I can't look at the questions right now, so I'm trying to answer it to the best of my abilities. So the robustness of the assay, yes, the assay, we, we do say it can accommodate anywhere from 0.1 to 1 millimolar ATP and um, um, but the thing is, uh, let's assume that you are at um, 100 micromolar ATP, and you're trying to uh, tr trying to look uh, for, say, um, 50 micromolar ADP production or 80 micromolar ADP production. With our assay, it it would the the MP change would be for 100 micromolar ADP. It would look like 20 MP. 80 micromolar ADP will also look like 22 MP. So you cannot make that distinguish uh, the uh, differentiation. So what we do is then we kind of ask you to run it at a lower ATP concentration. So if you ran it, say at um, at say um, 100 micromolar a ATP, then you can distinguish between 10 micromolar and 8 mic micromolar really well. So it's it's really sensitive at the lower end. So you have to adjust your ATP concentration depending upon where you want to be. So you are at the initial velocity. Um, so if, um, I don't know if I'm answering this uh, precisely. So if um, uh, if you want to measure 8 micromolar ADP and you're using 100 micromolar ATP, you're converting very, very little and you may not see that difference because, um, you know, it's uh, really less. 
Uh, so, um, or so, for example, you're trying to measure 8 micromolar ADP from 1 millimolar ATP. You're not going to be able to do that very well because you are converting very less and you won't be able to detect that very clearly. So if you want to measure 8 micromolar ADP, we would say run it at 50 micromolar ATP initial concentration so you can distinguish between uh, 20 micromolar ADP production versus 8 micromolar ADP production. So we would just make you move, uh, start the reaction at a lower ATP concentration so you can distinguish, find, you can distinguish finely between uh, you know, 15 and 10 versus at 1,000 micromolar, you won't be able to see that difference whether you are, you know, can you measure 8 micromolar ADP, you probably won't. I, was that, I, I hope if it's not clear, I would definitely like to, uh, you know, I would answer via email, but I would appreciate if one of you can contact me. Yep, I'll um, connect to you afterwards. Was, I get uh, to understand what... I'll go ahead and connect you, you afterwards, Mia, no problem. Uh, one other question, um, if, if you have to consider equilibration time between the ADP uh, generated by the enzyme uh, and the antibody. Yes. Uh, the equilibration time for this particular antibody is around 5 to 10 minutes. So we have, I, I should have shown that data today. We have data showing uh, equilibration time of 5 minutes. So that enables uh, kinetic measurements possible. Um, and uh, the, the equilibration varies between different antibodies. For the ADP, it's really rapid. So um, in 5 minutes uh, is the equilibration time. Just in technical manuals, we do say 60 minutes, wait for 60 minutes just to make sure that, you know, uh, people are doing it the right way. But in uh, theoretically, 5 minutes uh, should be good for the equilibration. And Mira, can you speak anything about whether we recommend this uh, uh, for fluorescence polarization or if uh, you, you're planning on doing any testing for uh, the TR fret uh, or other readouts? Uh, definitely. Theoretically, yes, it's possible for both FI and so all the data that I showed today is from fluorescent polarization assay and um, uh, all transcreener assays have the ability to be run in kinetic mode. So it can be run in FI and TRFRET as well. Um, although with TRFRET, there, uh, there is one thing to remember that um, the terbium uh, antibody does not like uh, certain metals. Um, I, um, I, it's not mag magnesium, but it could be manganese. Manganese probably, if you have manganese in there in your enzyme buffer, you won't be able to run it in a kinetic mode. So, um, uh, you know, that, that's the one caveat of TR fret. If your enzyme buffer does not have manganese or I think um, there is another metal, I can, it's not coming to my uh, memory right now, but um, manganese or other heavy metals, if you have something like that, then it might interfere, but with just magnesium in the buffer, yes, with FI and with TR fret, you should be able to uh, run residence time, uh, determine residence time, just following the exact same protocol that I showed today. Yeah, and just as an add on to that, we gave examples today with uh, the ADP, uh, detection for kinases, uh, but this technology should also be applicable to the other uh, readouts uh, shown here. And so we will be doing follow-up uh, case studies looking at some of the other um, enzyme target classes uh, just to show that it has a, a bit wider uh, application as well. But if you have any questions on, on those or on the other methods, please feel free to contact us. Um, Sorry, are there uh, any other questions before we conclude? Um, I think with that, I'll go ahead and take it offline. And uh, yes, we will be uh, providing a, a link to the recording, as I mentioned, as well as the slide sets uh, in a PDF uh, for review. Uh, we'll start working on that and get it out to you within the uh, next week. If any follow-up questions uh, uh, happen in that time, uh, feel free to please uh, email us or contact us by phone. And uh, thank you very much for attending the webinar today.